we continue with the interpretation of Jeffrey Pfeffer's Seven Rules of Power. Before getting into the specifics of this book, I'd like to emphasize once again that not everyone should pursue power. If you feel uncomfortable boasting about yourself, if you find happiness in quietly contributing to the collective, if you insist on being your authentic self, if you always engage with others sincerely, if you hope to be liked by everyone, then you should not chase after power. The state of pursuing power is not a comfortable one. The first rule of power is to overcome psychological barriers, step out of your comfort zone, and switch to a power mindset. You must be very clear about wanting power, not comfort. You need to overcome for psychological barriers. First, self-promotion, not humility. Chinese working in the United States often have an impression. Americans, especially Indians, are better at self-promotion than Chinese. You put a lot of effort into writing code, and Indians go up and present with PowerPoint. We feel this is unfair, but we also look down on those who just talk the talk, thinking it's not a real skill. Yet in the game of power, talking the talk is often successful. Talented and skilled individuals often have the virtue of humility. You always feel that your achievements are not worth boasting about, and so you don't boast. This is not a virtue. There was a Stanford MBA student who had a medical degree and managed her own company, a truly outstanding individual. When the teacher asked her to talk about her achievements in front of the whole class, she was embarrassed and lacked confidence. Pfeffer says this is a problem that needs addressing. Psychologists call this imposter syndrome. It's said that two-thirds of high achievers suffer from this syndrome. You've achieved great results and reached a high position, but you still feel inadequate, like an imposter. The trouble with this syndrome is that your lack of confidence is palpable to others, making them also feel you're not capable. This sets off a vicious cycle. When you hesitate to do things, your productivity decreases, insecurity increases, you procrastinate, all proving your perceived incompetence. The key takeaway here is that your confidence is not just useful for you. It's also useful for others. Your colleagues, especially subordinates, expect to see confidence in you. You might think that you don't need to demonstrate it. Over time, everyone will naturally recognize you. Reality is that others simply don't have the time to scrutinize you carefully, and lack of confidence signifies lack of ability. How do you overcome this barrier? First, look closely at those in high positions and think about what makes them special. You'll find that they are not necessarily more qualified than you. Furthermore, you need training. Self-promotion and self-presentation might make you uncomfortable, so practice until it feels natural. Pretending to be confident can lead you into a positive cycle. When you fake confidence, others' expectations of you rise slightly, and your expectations of yourself also increase. This principle is called embodied cognition. When you behave confidently, you truly become more confident in your thoughts. You'll dare to do more things, succeed in them, and gain genuine confidence. Pfeffer mentions that some foreign students in his class, likely including many Chinese, privately tell him they don't want to participate in class discussions. I'm not good at speaking, and my English isn't great. Can I just do the assignments and exams without wasting everyone's time in class? Consider how absurd that is. Did you take this course on power to study in solitude? Isn't the purpose to train yourself to compete for power? If you're afraid of participating in class discussions, how can you talk about power? Pfeffer says a key method of acquiring power is to assert your views and persuade others during discussions. Class discussions involve no real contest for interests and are thus the safest practice. Why not make use of such valuable training opportunities? Second, individualism over collectivism. This is a deeper truth. Our common values tend to favor quiet dedication, being a good person, believing that good things will naturally happen to us in the future. The notion of God loves dumb child. Pfeffer cites research suggesting that thinking this way indicates you're not from a high social class. The upper class does not believe in quiet dedication. They believe they should seize all advantages, ideally with others' dedication, and benefits going to them. Eaton College, the most famous public school 
in the UK, educates children from influential families. Someone once studied the students there, to understand their strengths. It turned out their greatest strength, was shamelessness. The gift from God, and their superpower. These individuals shamelessly, demand their own benefits. If you deny them, they protest unabashedly, unafraid to claim, all the spoils for themselves. This is a completely different value system. Some research examined, two ways of acquiring power. Method A involves hard work, helping colleagues, contributing to the collective, which naturally gains you favor, and power within the group. Method B involves flattering superiors, cultivating relationships, and self-promotion. Which method would you prefer, A or B? All subjects in the study found, both methods effective. However, people from lower social classes, tended to prefer method A, and were reluctant to use method B, while those from higher social classes, were completely comfortable, with method B. Why is this? It's a matter of values. People from lower social classes, generally adhere to collectivist values, believing contributing to the collective, is good while grabbing benefits, for oneself is wrong. This might stem, from the necessity of solidarity, in lower classes, where collectivism, becomes a class sentiment. However, collectivism impedes, your pursuit of power. An interesting finding is that, in Stanford MBA classes, all other courses show no significant class differences, but Pfeffer's power course clearly attracts more interest, from students of higher socioeconomic backgrounds. This trend extends to gender and race. In Silicon Valley, white males are 42% more likely than white females to become executives, 149% more likely than Asian males, and 260% more likely than Asian females. Is this due to gender or racial discrimination? It depends on your interpretation. Women and Asians are both reluctant to self-promote. Is this due to societal or personal reasons? Society expects women to be cooperative and helpful, and sees Asians as a model minority. Smart, hardworking, compliant, and uninterested in dominating others. Women and Asians are inclined to conform to these societal expectations for a more comfortable life, but this leads them away from power. Researchers advise women and Asians seeking power to defy these societal expectations. At the very least, you must be willing to dominate others delegate tasks to others, and be willing to control them. This requires overcoming the psychological barrier of collectivism and equality. What if you think you can't overcome it? Am I wrong to advocate for collective contribution? You can reframe your pursuit of power as benefiting the collective better. There was a wise person who once told me about the dedication increment method. Yes, I strive for advancement for myself. Yet my promotion is also, to better serve the people. Thinking this way, can bring calm, to your inner self. Third, strategy over sincerity. The game of power, requires you to often speak strategically, rather than truthfully, which many people find uncomfortable. They say, I want to be true to myself. But this is foolish. What does it mean, to be true to yourself? Are you going to be your six-year-old self, 28-year-old self, or 60-year-old self? Being true to yourself is an illusion. Moreover, being true can harm you. A writer, on a whim, conducted an experiment, to be completely honest, for several weeks, not telling any lies. He told a colleague, if I weren't married, I'd like to date you. He told the nanny, if my wife leaves me, we can go out. He pointed out his in-laws' flaws to their face. Everyone was taken aback. And of course, he faced isolation. Having thoughts is fine, but expressing them all is foolish. Operating in power requires you to do the right things. Such as building social networks, flattering superiors, and self-promotion. Rather than being true to yourself. This is very uncomfortable, for many people. A manager at a healthcare institution, was promoted to CEO, with her number of subordinates increasing tenfold and she had to address all her subordinates. But she began by admitting her nervousness, and lack of confidence in addressing, such a large group for the first time. Can you think of a more foolish opening statement? She believed sincerity, would earn trust. But quite the opposite. No one will trust a leader, who openly admits her lack of confidence. 
We've mentioned before that, exposing a weakness can make others feel closer to you. But please note, power relations are not intimate relationships. To seize power, you should not expose your critical weaknesses. Studies show that, exposing weaknesses reduces leadership effectiveness. To gain power, strategic language and actions are essential because you must gain allies and supporters. Why would others support you? You must provide something they need. Perhaps it's some common ground, like being from the same hometown, or sharing a view on a certain issue. Or perhaps it's a direct benefit, like I'm willing to allocate more resources to your project. Your main concern should not be who you are, but who they are. You must understand their needs to facilitate an exchange of benefits. Saying nice things about someone is not because you like them, but because you need them as an ally. You might say, but lying isn't good. What if the lie is exposed? Then you're being naive. We've read Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers, What We Should Know About, The People We Don't Know Before. People are actually terrible at detecting lies. Pfeffer adds, if this lie is good for them, they're even more likely to believe it. Everyone believes others should treat them well. The fourth rule is, to dominate, not to be liked. Most people want to be liked, saying, I want to be gentle, a nice guy. But studies have found that, in all cultures, competence and niceness are negatively correlated. Everyone says you're nice, a good person, a pushover, but it also implies your competence is lacking. Someone studied online reviews of books or movies and found that, even if positive reviews were better written, people generally believed those who posted negative reviews were more competent. So in the game of power, it's like dating. You don't want to be labeled the nice guy. The higher you climb, the less you should strive to be liked. If everyone likes you, people will think you lack competence. Being liked indicates high agreeableness. High agreeableness means being affectionate and compliant, not daring to break rules or stand by principles. Such a person is not fit to lead. Furthermore, research shows that, especially for men, high agreeableness results in lower wages. Think about it. How often do TV shows feature nice guys as protagonists? Everyone expects a CEO to be domineering. Of course, if you're particularly unsociable, selfish, or contentious, that's also not good. Such behaviors mean you're not contributing to the collective, so people won't support you. But the advantage is that you dare to dominate others, which is a plus. Overall, being antisocial won't hurt you in the game of power. Forcing yourself to be sociable, fearing rejection, by the collective, is a psychological barrier. How do you overcome this barrier? Researchers suggest demonstrating competence first, then showing friendliness. If others already recognize your strength, showing a warm attitude won't make them think you're weak. Instead, it will be seen as a pleasant surprise. In Chinese terms, it's showing toughness first, then compassion. To be more direct, it's hitting first, then giving a sweet date. Progressing further, it's akin to PUA. The key is to be tough first, then gentle. Don't mix up the order. This section may seem blunt. If you find all this awkward, it might be due to our inherent, submissive mentality. I coined this term. Submissive mentality is the antonym of a power mindset. For 2,000 years of imperial rule, Chinese commoners never had the habit of fighting for their own power. We assumed officials were selected through exams and power was bestowed from above. From childhood, we were taught to be humble, compliant, likable, and sincere. We always thought that, as long as we did these things, the masses would naturally support us and leaders would naturally promote us. Little did we know, even in China, that's just a fairy tale. Having a position does not equate to having power. Real power has always been something one must strive for themselves. To rid yourself of a submissive mentality, imagine striving for power as playing football. Football is a competitive sport. Making certain actions on the edge of foul play, even faking a penalty, is not immoral. It's necessary to win. You can refuse to play football. But you can't say, you want to play a non-competitive version of football. Because there's no such thing as non-competitive football in the world. That's the content of this section. Next, we'll discuss, don't follow the rules. 
If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comment section. Let's grow together and read more good books.